Imagine if someday we ourselves should be remembered with words and phrases like this. Brilliant. Decisive. Quick to act. Kind-hearted. Cheerful. Faithful. And courteous. Having audacity and resourcefulness. Imperiousness and toughness and characterized by steady diligence, noble behavior, high honesty, and steadfast zeal for the common welfare of all, with an aspiration to know the world. That was Ivan Kuskov, reflected in the words of both his peers and biographers. Ivan Alexandrovich Kuskov was born in 1765 in the town of Totma, 400 miles northeast of Moscow, just a few years after Catherine the Great had begun her rule. Fifty-eight years later, Kuskov would die in Tolma and be buried there. But he did not spend his life there. Ivan Kuskov saw much of the world. He explored new territories and had many grand adventures, some of them fraught with great difficulty and danger. Without a doubt, his greatest achievement was the founding of Colony Ross, here on the shores of Northern California on the other side of the world from Totma. Naturally, the considerable distance between these two places can be measured in miles, but it also can be measured by the amount of passion and energy and conviction that is necessary to make the long journey. The trip from Totma to Fort Ross is a long one, even today. In his creation of Colony Ross, Kuskov successfully constructed a bridge between Russia and America, and that bridge still stands today. Kuskov was born to a middle-class family, the same class that accounted for many of Russia's public servants and merchants. In 1787, at the age of 22, Kuskov departed Totma for Siberia, as many adventurous Russians of his time were doing. It's apparent that Kuskov had fallen on bad times, and as a result was badly in debt, perhaps that explaining the reason for his departure. Kuskov's trip to Siberia was not entirely legal, as he lacked the necessary passport required of Russians for internal travel. Perhaps it was this quasi-illegal status of his that initially led Kuskov to the Russian-American company, and eventually on to Bodega Bay and Fort Ross. In 1787, Kuskov traveled to eastern Siberia, where he met Alexander Baranov, Baranov would later negotiate a contract with businessman Grigory Shelikov and his partner Ivan Golikov, both of them rising commercial figures in Irkutsk. In his contractual arrangement with these men, Baranov agreed to go to Alaska, where he would help manage the trading post they had recently established on Kodiak Island. In 1799, the trading company that Shelikov and Golikov began was renamed the Russian American Company. On August 17, 1790, Baranov concluded his contract with Shelikov and Golikov, which specified that he, Baranov, would be allowed to take two assistants of his own choice to Alaska. Baranov quickly hired Kuskov to be his assistant, and Kuskov became Baranov's right-hand man, remaining so for the duration of Baranov's time with the Russian-American company. Kuskov traveled with Baranov on the long overland trail linking the city of Irkutsk with the coastal town of Okhotsk in the Russian Far East. The trail involved a horseback trip of more than 160 miles from Irkutsk to the Lena River, and then sailing down the Lena River for 1,200 miles, and then traveling by foot or horseback the arduous 450 miles east to Okhotsk. The trip to Alaska continued by sailing ship, crossing the temperamental Sea of Akast and the North Pacific Ocean, before making landfall in Alaska. Even today, this is a long and difficult journey. In 1790, it separated the hardy and adventurous from all those too timid to try. Once in Alaska, Kuskov set to work for Baranov. Kuskov served as manager of the redoubt on Prince William Sound and commanded long-distance sea otter hunting parties that traveled to as far south as the northwest coast in California. Prior to 1804, Kuskov served as manager of the main establishment on Kodiak Island whenever Barnoff was away. After 1804, he became the second-in-command at the newly created Russian settlement at Sitka. 
Between 1808 and 1811, Kuskoff made several voyages to California, seeking a location for a new colony. In 1812, he sailed back to California above the Cherkov with orders to create Colony Ross. As Kuskoff's men set about building their new settlement in California, Napoleon Bonaparte led his 500,000-strong French army across the border in an ill-fated invasion of Russia. And a young United States declared a war on a more powerful Great Britain, thus initiating the War of 1812. Closer to home, members of the local Coast Miwok nations were lured, coerced, or forced into servitude in the Spanish missions that had been constructed by the Franciscans in San Francisco and San Jose. The world was in a state of flux, and Cusco's return to California was but a small part of it. Once back in California, Kuskoff chose a site for the new outpost, and then he and his men set about constructing the fortified settlement we know today as Fort Ross. A wooden stockade was erected inside which were built working and living structures. In time, a thriving multicultural community sprang up just outside the fort's walls. The community was created at a place known as Matini by the local Kushaya Pomo, with their permission. But what of the founder himself, this man who we know as Ivan Kuskov? Understanding the creation of Fort Ross and the very presence of that settlement here on the coast of Northern California requires that we understand the man, Kuskov. What has always impressed me about Fort Ross is the fact that Kuskov was able to create the settlement and hold on to it for all those years without the use of violence. It was a rather violent time in California's history, as Spanish forces and institutions attempted to wrestle control of the state's natural resources and indigenous peoples. That struggle was written in the blood of the people. But onto the scene came Ivan Kuskov, with his lofty ideals and his powerful cannon. How did he manage to create Colony Ross and never once have to fire his cannons to defend it? In June of 1802, Kuskoff led a large party of Alaskan hunters on an excursion from Kodiak to southeastern Alaska. While he was hunting, the Russian settlement at Sitka was attacked by the local Klinkit Indians. The Klinkit succeeded in taking the settlement, killing the 20 Russian men and 130 Aleuts, capturing the women and children, and torching the various wooden structures. Further north, near Yucatan, Kuskoff's party was attacked as well and had to fight for their lives. Two years later, Baranov led a large contingent of Russians and native Alaskans in the retaking of Sitka, and was gravely wounded in the process. Kuskov accompanied Baranov, and from that time on, was his second in command at Sitka. In 1805, some of the Klinkit, including some who were the servants of the Russians, rose up once again, this time destroying the settlement at Yucatan and massacring 40 of the Russians, men, women, and children in the process. Kuskov had spent time at Yakutat and knew many of the dead. The Klinkit uprisings undoubtedly affected him. Kuskov understood the importance of treating the local indigenous people fairly and showing them the respect they deserved, and he knew that it was important to reconcile any differences and grievances before they could explode in violence. Now Kuskov realized the dire consequences of any failure to do so. Prior to having founded Fort Ross, Kuskoff entered into a common-law marriage with the daughter of an Indian chief from southeast Alaska. This was probably in 1810. The woman's name was Ekaterina Prakaravna, suggesting that she had been baptized prior to her marriage to Kuskoff, and that her godfather's name was Prakor. What is most interesting is that Ekaterina was Klinkit, the very tribe that had only recently risen up in resistance to the Russian presence, in southeastern Alaska. While it's not clear to me how Kuskov came to marry Ekaterina, the importance of his marrying the daughter of a Klinkit chief during the time of the Russian Klinkit reconciliation cannot be understated. Rather than a marriage of convenience, however, Kuskov and his bride appear to have enjoyed their life together. When Kuskov sailed to California in 1812, Ekaterina went along with him, and she lived at Fort Ross for the 10 years he was there. They built their house within the stockade walls and furnished it with the trappings of their position, including a piano. Portraits of the two of them were painted while at Fort Ross, possibly in 1813. These portraits provide us an opportunity to look into their eyes and to wonder about their lives. 
Kuskoff is depicted wearing the single-breasted coat of a commerce counselor, and he has a ribbon around his neck, from which is suspended the gold medal awarded him in 1804 for his diligence. Ekaterina is wearing a lace-edged dress with shawl, and around her neck a strand of smooth pearls. The two appear reserved and dignified, as would be expected of such an occasion. When Kuskov was recalled from Fort Ross after his ten years of service there, he took Ekaterina with him. They sailed to Sitka, and from there on to Russia aboard the Cherkov, the same ship that had brought the two of them to California ten years earlier. Along the way, the ship stopped at Kodiak, and while there, Kuskov and his common-law wife were properly married in the monastery. From Kodiak, the Cherikov delivered to Kuskov's Akkost, from where they embarked on their long overland trek to St. Petersburg, and then on to Totma. Kuskov died the year after he arrived in Totma. Three years later, Ekaterina remarried, this time to an alcohol cell supervisor by the name of Popov. In 1990, the Kuskov History Museum was opened in Totma in order to commemorate one of its most famous citizens. The portraits that were made of the Kuskovs at Fort Ross are displayed in the museum. In 1812, as Kuskov supervised the construction of Fort Ross, the Klinka uprisings were undoubtedly on his mind. While the local Kushaya Pomo and Bodega Miwok appeared to be friendly, even encouraging of a settlement, Kuskov had to wonder if the tragic events of Sitka might repeat themselves here on the remote shores of Nova Albion. As a defense, Kuskov had his men construct a mighty fortress of hand-hewn redwood and arm it with their many powerful cannons. Furthermore, the men armed themselves with musket and saber and conducted regular militia drills, determined not to be caught unprepared. While Kuskov may have worried about an Indian attack in 1812, he used his common sense to ward off any such possibility. By treating the local people with respect and dignity, Kuskov mitigated most of the uncomfortableness they might have felt with his settlement's presence. Furthermore, Kuskov punished any of his men who were called abusing local Indian women. This was appreciated by the local tribes. Many of the men, both Russian and Alaskan, took wives among the local Kushaya Pomo and Bodega Miwok. In most cases, the marriages were successful, creating a sense of community at Ross and providing the colony with a multitude of children. In many instances, the men took their wives and children back to Alaska and Russia when their service at Colony Ross ended. Although Kuskov and other company officials had arranged with the local Pomo and Miwok for the use of their lands, not all of the tribesmen agreed with the Russian presence. In the census that Kuskov prepared for Ross Colony in 1820-1821, a number of Indian men are listed as serving time at Fort Ross or at the hunting our tail on South Farallon Island. Their crimes, such as killing the best horses and burning the wheat fields, suggest some level of active resistance was underway within the Russian colony. This resistance became much more common in the 1830s, long after Kuskov had departed Fort Ross. Although Kuskov pursued agriculture more and more while he was at Fort Ross, especially after 1817, he never once forced the local tribal people to assist in the endeavor, unless they did so willingly. Nor did he force their participation in any other venture. The decision to participate appears to have always been left to the Kushaya and Bodega Miwok. However, by the 1830s, the Russians were so desperate for farm workers that they took to impressing large groups of native people and forcing them to work for months at a time. One account from the mid-1830s, notes a slaving raid made on the inhabitants of an area near present-day Hillsburg, in which more than 150 men, women, and children were herded to the Kostromitinoff Ranch on Willow Creek and forced to harvest the crops. Naturally, such desperate actions intensified native resistance and the understandable resolve to rid their land of all foreigners, Spanish, California, and Russian. The fact that Mariano Vallejo was already engaged in a military struggle against the Southern Pomo and Wapo at this time only made the Fort Ross situation more tenuous. Whereas it's telling the contrast Kuskov's treatment of the native people around Fort Ross to that of the Spanish around San Francisco Bay, it's also worth contrasting his treatment to that afforded native people by the later managers of Fort Ross. In any such comparison, Kuskov is exceptional. Whereas the local Pomo and Miwok were afforded protection by the company managers following Kuskov, that was not always the case with the native people living further inland. 
However, during Kuskov's tenure, Russians could freely roam far inland from Fort Ross and never worry about being molested by the local native people. That was certainly not true for the Spanish residents around San Francisco Bay, nor was it true of Russians in the years after Kuskov's departure. Again, Ivan Kuskov was an exceptional man, and his exceptional intellect and goodwill allowed Fort Ross to function in ways that were not possible in the years after his departure. Eventually, the souring relationship with some of the local tribes may have indirectly undermined the stability and efficiency of the colony, and thus added to its final demise in 1841. Kuskov's abilities are also evident in his handling of the Spanish objection to the presence of Colony Ross. When a small delegation of Spanish soldiers appeared at Fort Ross in mid-October of 1812, Kuskov was cordial and even invited the Spanish officer in charge of the soldiers to look around the newly constructed settlement. At this point, Kuskov probably already knew that the Spanish garrison in San Francisco was no match for his well-armed employees. And whereas the few Spanish cannons at the San Francisco Presidio were in disrepair, Kuskov had brought with him numerous cannon, all in fine shape. The Spanish officer in charge of the delegation took note of that fact. I cannot imagine that Kuskov ever considered the Spanish a military threat, but the political threat they represented was a different matter. Although the Spanish authorities objected to the presence of Fort Ross, relations between the people of San Francisco and Fort Ross were remarkably warm and supportive. A considerable amount of commerce and exchange was carried on between the two communities. At the time of the founding of Fort Ross, Alta California was under the charge of Governor Jose Joaquin de Arigula. Although Governor Arigula was officially opposed to the Russian presence, he didn't press the issue and thus unofficially allowed for the mutually beneficial exchange between the Spanish and Russian communities. When Governor Arigula died two years later, he was replaced with a quite different personality, Jose de Arguello, a man who pressed home the Spanish case for the abandonment of Colony Ross. For the remainder of Kuskov's time at Ross, the Spanish authorities worked diligently against his success. The creation of Mission San Rafael in 1817, near the southern border of Colony Ross, was one way they attempted to thwart the feared expansion of the Russian colony. In 1823, the Mexican authorities approved the creation of Mission San Francisco Solano in what is now the town of Sonoma for that very same reason. Throughout his career with the Russian-American Company, Kuskov showed great resolve and intellect, and it was in these innate abilities that he found success. Kuskov was not a very educated man, and he spoke no languages but his own, unlike the other managers that followed him at Fort Ross. He said to have had a wooden leg, and he walked with the aid of a crutch. He had a temper, but also the patience and good sense to temper it. He genuinely cared about people, and this allowed him to become a leader that others would follow. Indeed, when Kuskov passed through Kodiak on his way home to Toltma in 1822, the local Russian manager was warned to be wary of him, for he still held the respect of the old-timers, and his influence might prove a distraction in a Russian-American company no longer guided by Kuskov's old friend, Alexander Baranov. In his later years, Kuskov was recommended the prestigious Cross of St. Vladimir, a medal that he did not live to see. Kuskov died a relatively poor man, leaving an estate of just over 70,000 rubles. Having no children, the estate went to his wife, Ekaterina. In spite of Kuskov's success, some have said that he had little to show for the 31 years he spent with the Russian-American company. As we all know, of course, one's legacy is calculated by much more than the size of an estate at death. Other men, much richer men than Ivan Kuskov, also died in 1823, and precious few of them are still remembered today. We remember Ivan Kuskov not because of his wealth, but because of his ideas, his ideals, and his deeds. Ivan Kuskov built a bridge that linked Russia and America, and we all travel it still. For this, we owe him our eternal gratitude.